Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today, we're going to be discussing the Death Eaters, delving into the ranks of Voldemort's most powerful followers and uncovering which of these dark witches and wizards are most dangerous. As a young boy, Tom Riddle lacked a normal range of human emotions. However, that certainly didn't mean he was unable to control people. His cunning, manipulative nature eventually meant that he would form a gang of sorts, a group consisting of his fellow Slytherin students. The gang that Riddle formed was once described by Dumbledore as a mixture of the weak seeking protection, the ambitious seeking glory, and the thuggish seeking a leader who could show them more refined cruelty. This group were, at that time, known as the Knights of Walpurgis. But if we fast forward to the year 1970, 32 years after Tom Riddle had started attending Hogwarts and the beginning of Voldemort's rise to power, these Knights of Walpurgis were known by a different name, Death Eaters. As far as dark witches and wizards went, the Death Eaters were the worst. This group was comprised of evil witches and wizards that were all hell-bent on pursuing their dark ambitions. They were the followers of Lord Voldemort, and they obeyed his every bidding in an effort to cleanse the wizarding world, the ultimate goal being to restore pure blood authority. And unfortunately, Voldemort managed to amass quite a lot of them. Today, we'll be taking a look at each and every one of these followers, uncovering who they were and just how valuable their contributions may have been to Voldemort. I'd also like to mention that I'll be sticking to official Death Eaters only, and not just wizards who followed Voldemort, whether imperialist or not. There were many followers of Voldemort that were not granted Death Eater status or given the Dark Mark, but were allowed to wear Death Eater garments in order to command the respect they engendered. This group was comprised of individuals that Voldemort found useful, but did not want to directly associate himself with. A good example of someone in this category would be Fenrir Greyback. With all of that established, let's get into it. But before we go any further, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Surfshark, the award-winning VPN service that ensures your privacy and security. With Surfshark, experience safe and anonymous browsing while protecting yourself from online trackers and data collectors. But safe browsing isn't all Surfshark offers. Ever searched for a show on Netflix and been unable to find it? Well, Netflix actually has most shows and movies, they just vary depending on where you are. So even though you're paying for a full subscription, you only get access to a part of their library. Enter Surfshark, where magic beckons. With their services, you can change your virtual location and unlock a multitude of movies and shows that were once beyond your reach. With an astounding 3200 servers spanning across 100 countries, you'll be indulging in lightning fast streaming before you can say Accio Entertainment. If this interests you, get an exclusive deal right now. Three months completely free. Just visit surfshark.deals slash hptheory. The link's also in the pinned comment and description below. Thanks again to Surfshark, let's get back to the video. Goyle Sr. was the father of Draco Malfoy's lackey, Gregory Goyle, and came from pure blood roots, with the family name notably appearing on the Sacred 28. Goyle Sr.'s capacity as a Death Eater resided in his fierce loyalty to Voldemort. He fought for the dark side during several battles throughout the series, but his most notable contribution was fighting at the Battle of Hogwarts alongside his fellow Death Eaters. Despite his loyalty, however, Goyle was said to be quite unintelligent, something that he inevitably passed down to his son. Goyle Sr. likely died during the Battle of Hogwarts. Crabbe Sr. was the father of Draco Malfoy's other main lackey, Vincent Crabbe, and was another Death Eater with rich, pure blood roots. Crabbe Sr.'s capacity as a Death Eater was centered around his talents in dark magic. Similar to Goyle, Crabbe Sr. was highly prejudiced and quite unintelligent, which didn't give his son Vincent Crabbe much of a chance. However, he was cunning enough to avoid imprisonment following Voldemort's first downfall. He notably tries to use the killing curse on Hermione Granger during the Battle of the Department of Mysteries. Mulciber Sr., father of Mulciber Jr., was a dark wizard and one of the earliest Death Eaters of Lord Voldemort. Unfortunately, we don't know much about him, including his whereabouts. However, he didn't appear to be present during the Second Wizarding War. This tells me that he was either dead or imprisoned in Azkaban. Wilkes was a Death Eater whose origins and blood status are unknown. He entered into Voldemort's service during the First Wizarding War and was reasonably skilled in both the Dark Arts as well as martial magic. Wilkes was said to have been killed by auras 
prior to Voldemort's first defeat. Avery Jr. was a pure-blood wizard that followed in his father's footsteps to become a Death Eater. His father, Avery Sr., was one of the members of Voldemort's original gang during his time at school. During Avery Jr.'s own time at school, he was a close friend of Severus Snape. At Voldemort's rebirth, Avery groveled before the Dark Lord. He confessed that he thought Voldemort was finished and didn't bother seeking him out. Avery weakly begged for forgiveness on behalf of the Death Eaters, but instead of mercy, Voldemort sadistically tortured him with the Cruciatus Curse. Avery was involved in the Battle of the Department of Mysteries, paired with fellow Death Eater Walton McNair in their quest to retrieve the prophecy. His weak character and lack of loyalty tells me that he was probably not a powerful Death Eater. Not Senior was one of the earliest Death Eaters, joining Voldemort's cause in 1965. Not was involved in a number of battles during the Second Wizarding War, including the Battle of the Department of Mysteries, where he was stunned by Hermione Granger after attempting to grab a hold of Harry Potter and his friends. After being stunned, Not lay on the floor motionless as shelves of prophecies collapsed on top of him. He was later sent to Azkaban. Rosier Sr., father of Evan Rosier, was one of the earliest Death Eaters and quickly flocked to the dark side under Lord Voldemort's reign. Aside from participating in the First Wizarding War, not much is known about Rosier Sr. To this day, it's unclear whether he's dead or alive. However, we do know a little bit about his son, Evan Rosier. Because Evan Rosier grew up to become such a promising dark wizard, I'd be willing to bet that Rosier Sr. was powerful in his own right. Gibbon was a Death Eater known for his proficiency in the dark arts, particularly the unforgivable curses. Gibbon notably fought in the Battle of the Astronomy Tower, for which he cast the Dark Mark into the sky. Interestingly, Gibbon lost his life in this battle as a result of friendly fire. When fellow Death Eater Thorfinn Rowl fired a killing curse at Remus Lupin, he missed, hitting Gibbon instead. Rabistan Lestrange was a Death Eater infamous for his participation in the torture of Frank and Alice Longbottom. He committed this atrocity with his brother Rodolphus, sister-in-law Bellatrix, and fellow Death Eater Barty Crouch Jr. As a Death Eater, Rabistan Lestrange had significant magical strength and was well-versed in the Dark Arts. His proficiency with the Cruciatus Curse is said to be especially noteworthy. Rabistan participated in many battles over the course of the First and Second Wizarding Wars, including the Battle of the Department of Mysteries and Battle of Hogwarts. Of the Lestrange brothers, he was said to be the more nervous one. Jugson was a Dark Wizard and a Death Eater, who served under Lord Voldemort during the Second Wizarding War. He participated in several battles, including the Battle of the Department of Mysteries and Battle of Hogwarts. During the former, Jugson was hit with the full body bind curse while pursuing Harry Potter, Hermione Granger, and Neville Longbottom. However, before this happened, him and his partner on the mission, Antonin Dolohov, were able to successfully hit all three of them with an impediment jinx. It's also worth noting that Jugson was quite an impatient man who had little regard for his comrades. It's unclear what happened to Jugson after the war. Selwyn was a dark wizard that served Voldemort's cause during the Second Wizarding War and participated in a multitude of battles. At one point, he was grouped with fellow Death Eater Travers and sent on a mission to ambush Harry, Ron, and Hermione at the Lovegood house under a tip from Xenophilius Lovegood. Selwyn was a particularly cruel individual known for beating up and torturing Xenophilius, as well as threatening to mutilate his daughter, Luna. Travers, on the other hand, participated in both the First and Second Wizarding Wars. During the First War, he was responsible for murdering the family of Order of the Phoenix member Marlene McKinnon. Tragically, the McKinnons were one of the only wizarding families that Voldemort and his followers were able to completely wipe out. In terms of magical ability, Travers was quite gifted, able to cast a diverse array of dark curses as well as a multitude of useful charms, notably the Human Presence Revealing spell. In general demeanor, Travers was quite a calm wizard. However, there was certainly a lot brewing beneath the surface. He was absolutely obsessed with blood purity and was even somewhat of a xenophobe. Electo and Amicus Caro were a brother-sister Death Eater duo that were installed at Hogwarts as professors following Voldemort's takeover of the school. In place of Defense Against the Dark Arts, Amicus was appointed as the new Dark Arts professor. Electo, on the other hand, was in charge of Muggle Studies, teaching the subject in an entirely new way. Both siblings were present for most of the battles that took place over the course of the Second Wizarding War and were said to be quite magically talented particularly in the realm of the Dark Arts. 
With that said, however, both Electo and Amicus were bested in a duel by the powerful Minerva McGonagall, who forced them to run off with their arms covering their heads. Walden McNair was a dark wizard and one of Lord Voldemort's earliest Death Eaters. He served as a ruthless servant of the Dark Lord through his participation in both the First and Second Wizarding Wars. After Voldemort's first downfall, he worked as an executioner for the Committee for the Disposal of Dangerous Creatures in the Ministry of Magic. McNair's personality was cruel, evil, bloodthirsty, and malicious. He was ruthless and often took pleasure in his job as an executioner. During the Battle of the Department of Mysteries, he even attempted to brutally strangle Harry Potter, but was stopped by Neville Longbottom, who poked him in the eye with Hermione Granger's wand. Draco Malfoy, son of Lucius Malfoy, was a conflicted young wizard that acted as Harry's rival and one of the main antagonists throughout the story. Characterized by arrogance, snobbishness, and a sense of entitlement, Draco chose to embrace the beliefs of his family and join the Death Eaters at a relatively young age. While not directly involved in any significant battles, Draco plays a notable role as a Death Eater when he's assigned the task of assassinating Albus Dumbledore, something which he ultimately fails to do. In terms of magical ability, however, Draco was quite gifted. At a young age, he was given a wand made of Hawthorn, a material which is only ever placed in the hands of a talented young witch or wizard. He also received additional training from his powerful aunt Bellatrix after joining the ranks of the Death Eaters. Rodolphus Lestrange, husband of Bellatrix Lestrange, played a significant role as a Death Eater and fought in both the First and Second Wizarding Wars. In terms of personality, Rodolphus is depicted as very loyal to Voldemort and fully committed to the cause of pure blood supremacy. He was also known to have a particularly cruel and ruthless nature. This is well showcased by his torture of Frank and Alice Longbottom in the First Wizarding War. Rodolphus was considered to be one of Voldemort's top Death Eaters, taking part in a multitude of different battles over the course of both wars. He was skilled in the dark arts as well as martial magic. However, he was notably bested by his niece, Nymphadora Tonks, during the Battle of the Seven Potters. Mulciber Jr., son to Mulciber Sr., one of the original Death Eaters, was a dark wizard that joined Voldemort's cause in the Second Wizarding War. As a boy, he attended Hogwarts at the same time as Severus Snape, Lily Potter, and the Marauders, with Lily once remarking that he was creepy and had an evil sense of humor. He was notably paired with Lucius Malfoy during the Battle of the Department of Mysteries. According to Igor Karkaroff, what set Mulciber Jr. apart from others was his extreme proficiency in performing the Imperius Curse. The unforgivable curse that allows you to control others. Apparently, this curse, which allowed him to force people to do horrific things, was his specialty. Augustus Rookwood was one of Voldemort's most formidable allies, and by the time of the Second Wizarding War, one of his oldest. Rookwood served a unique role within the rank of the Death Eaters. He was a mole within the Ministry of Magic. Of course, for Voldemort to succeed in his campaigns against his fellow wizards, he needed to lure many influential ministry workers to his cause. But Augustus was special because he worked in the Department of Mysteries, the very place that held the secrets of thought, love, time, and death. Rookwood notably took on Kingsley Shacklebolt one-on-one during the Battle of the Department of Mysteries. Though Rookwood lost, his ability to hold his own for any amount of time with a wizard as powerful as Kingsley is a testament to his power. He was also able to take on a massive group of students all by himself during the Battle of Hogwarts. Lucius Malfoy, father of Draco and husband to Narcissa Black, was one of Voldemort's most trusted supporters, fulfilling his role as a Death Eater in both the First and Second Wizarding Wars. During the First Wizarding War, Lucius bravely battled against the Dark Lord's foes as his top lieutenant, guiding portions of the Dark Forces into combat. He fearlessly faced trained auras and members of the Order of the Phoenix, proving his strength and skill in the face of battle. He is known for his manipulation, cunning, and his desire to maintain the social and political standing of his family. Lucius is often seen as a cold and calculating individual, using his wealth and influence to further his own interests. In terms of power, I would say that Lucius is one of the most underrated, something which I feel can be partially attributed to his sometimes cowardly behavior. Peter Pettigrew was a former Marauder and Order of the Phoenix member that defected during the First Wizarding War, instead joining Voldemort's cause and becoming a Death Eater. Pettigrew was known for his weak and cowardly personality, 
a wizard that was easily influenced and gravitated towards those he perceived as powerful and capable of protecting him. Because Pettigrew was untalented as a boy, and because he had such a cowardly personality, many people mislabel him as a weak wizard. However, this is just not the case. Pettigrew could easily wield the killing curse, produce powerful blasting curses strong enough to destroy hundreds of feet of sewer system, create highly advanced potions, transfigure himself, conjure objects out of thin air, and more. Was he a bit of a sniveling coward? Yes. But was he a powerful sniveling coward? Certainly. Regulus Black was a pure-blood wizard and member of the famous Black family. He was the son of Orion and Woolberger Black, and younger brother of Sirius Black. In his youth, Regulus idolized Voldemort, which led to his eventual transformation into a Death Eater. However, Regulus later defected when he found out what Lord Voldemort was capable of doing in order to achieve his goals. Regulus was an extremely intelligent wizard, and had he not sacrificed his life, would have perhaps been one of the good guy's most valuable weapons against evil. He was also a very talented young wizard with a very promising future. Corbin Yaxley was known for his dedication to serving Lord Voldemort and his commitment to the ideals of the Death Eaters. He served Voldemort during both the First and Second Wizarding Wars. His personality exhibited ruthlessness, tenacity, and a deep loyalty to the Dark Lord's cause. As head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement under Voldemort's takeover, he used his position to persecute Muggleborns and enforce the oppressive regime. During the Second Wizarding War, Yaxley was tasked with a variety of missions, including the collection of Horace Slughorn, who Voldemort knew to be extremely powerful, as well as the capturing of Hermione Granger's parents. Based on the difficulty of the tasks that he was given, I think we can reasonably assume that Yaxley was quite a powerful dark wizard. Yaxley was notably gifted at the Imperius Curse, something which he used to control Pius' thickness for the duration of the war. Thorfinn Rall was a dark wizard and Death Eater. He had a large frame with blonde hair and was known for his role as one of Voldemort's henchmen, participating in several key battles during the Second Wizarding War. Rall's personality was mainly defined by his cruelty and sadism, which he exhibited on numerous occasions. But where Rall really shined was in his dueling ability. During the Battle of the Astronomy Tower, Rall proved his skill as a duelist, holding his ground against Nymphadora Tonks while casting curses left and right. He also posed a grave threat to Remus Lupin, nearly taking him down but instead missing and killing fellow Death Eater, Gibbon. Throughout the battle, Rall wreaked havoc, keeping members of the Order of the Phoenix and Dumbledore's army at bay, allowing his allies to corner a weakened Albus Dumbledore. Miraculously, he emerged from the battle mostly unharmed. Evan Rosier was the son of Rosier Sr., one of the earliest Death Eaters. Evan fought fiercely for Voldemort over the course of the First Wizarding War, and proved to be a force to be reckoned with. Over the course of this war, Death Eaters were fiercely pursued by Auras, one of which was a prime Alistair Moody, making the landscape quite treacherous for Dark Wizards. One day, Rosier was caught by Moody, but not without a fight. During Moody's capture of the Dark Wizard, Rosier was able to blast off a significant part of Moody's nose in the struggle. Given that Moody generally tried to avoid killing his enemies, it suggests that Rosier was simply too dangerous to try and capture alive. The fact that Evan was able to give Moody, the most powerful aura of all time, such a hard time, points to the fact that Evan was quite powerful in his own right. Igor Karkaroff was a pure-blood wizard and Death Eater that later became headmaster of Durmstrang Institute. Karkaroff has a very dark past, and when he was a young Death Eater, he would torture muggles along with Antonin Dolohov and others. In terms of his personality, Karkaroff was a bit of a snake, seemingly flip-flopping and showing allegiance to whoever happened to be in power at any given moment, sort of similar to Pettigrew. In the First Wizarding War, Karkaroff was eventually captured by the famous Aura Alistair Moody, and promptly sent to Azkaban. When the time came for Karkaroff to stand trial for his crimes, he blurted out the names of every Death Eater that he could think of, hoping that it would alleviate his sentence. By giving the Ministry the name Augustus Rookwood, the Ministry took leniency with Karkaroff, and he was eventually released from Azkaban. It was shortly after his release that he assumed the position of Headmaster at Durmstrang. Being that Karkaroff was the headmaster of a wizarding school, I'd be willing to bet that he possessed considerable magical ability. 
Antonin Dolohov was one of Lord Voldemort's most powerful and loyal followers. He was involved in both the First and Second Wizarding Wars and was responsible for torturing countless muggles and non-supporters of the Dark Lord. As far as dueling is concerned, Dolohov may have been one of the most successful Dark Wizards over the course of the two wars. During the Battle of the Department of Mysteries, he dueled the combo of Harry Potter, Hermione Granger, and Neville Longbottom single-handedly, despite a silencing charm forcing him to use all non-verbal magic. Shortly after, he defeated and injured Alistair Mad-Eye Moody in a duel, though he did not kill him. He then went on to duel the powerful Sirius Black, with whom he was able to hold his own. Dolohov's perhaps most humiliating moment was when he was put face to face with Ron, Hermione, and Harry in London. Hermione was able to take control of the situation and put Dolohov in a full body bind curse. However, the famous trio have been able to accomplish some amazing things together, so I'm really not too surprised. Barty Crouch Jr. was a Death Eater and son of Ministry of Magic official Bartimius Crouch Sr. Crouch Jr. has a rich history with the Death Eaters, joining them as early as his teenage years. In his earlier years, Barty Crouch Jr. was responsible for torturing Neville's parents and powerful auras, Frank and Alice Longbottom. He was also instrumental in Voldemort's resurgence. Crouch Jr. is most well known for kidnapping and imprisoning the powerful Mad-Eye Moody, then teaching at Hogwarts School for an entire year in his stead. I don't know what's more impressive, capturing Mad-Eye or teaching for an entire school year undetected. In my opinion, Crouch may be one of the most underrated wizards in all of history. Bellatrix Lestrange was one of, if not Voldemort's most loyal follower. She was a frightening pure-blood witch that came from the Black family, a long line of powerful witches and wizards with a twisted agenda. Bellatrix was one of the most powerful people in the wizarding world, period, responsible for killing a number of wizards including Sirius Black. Bellatrix was a known proponent of the Cruciatus Curse, and had considerable knowledge in the realm of the Dark Arts. Bellatrix was eventually defeated by Molly Weasley, which I think was really just the result of her not taking Molly seriously. Her confidence was overinflated, and she didn't focus when the two were dueling, laughing hysterically throughout. Molly, in full motherly protective mode, bested Bellatrix, and she was never to be seen again. Last but not least, we have Severus Snape. Snape knew more curses when he arrived at school than half the kids in seventh year, and he was part of a gang of Slytherins who nearly all turned out to be Death Eaters. Snape is widely considered to be one of the most gifted wizards in the entire Harry Potter series. His skills are only really outmatched by Voldemort, Dumbledore, and Grindelwald, who are in a bit of a class of their own, but Snape is extremely powerful nonetheless. During his time at Hogwarts, Snape assumed the identity the Half-Blood Prince, and scribbled all sorts of spell creations into his copy of Advanced Potion Making. Among these spells was the powerful and vicious Sectum Sempra. Snape can also fly, and is one of only two known wizards who are capable of doing this, the other being Voldemort. When Snape duels McGonagall in the film, he is clearly holding back, but matching an extremely powerful McGonagall nonetheless. This is similar to the scene in the Ministry Atrium, where Dumbledore is holding back against Voldemort, but to a more significant degree. Snape is also cited as saying that Voldemort is the most accomplished legilimens the world has ever seen, which would mean that him being able to keep Voldemort out of his mind would, in a way, make him one of the most professed Occlumens. There's truly no telling what Snape would have been able to accomplish if he had lived a more linear life, and I can confidently say that he was the most powerful of the Death Eaters. And that concludes today's video. Do you agree with my rankings? Let me know what your top 10, 20, or 30 would look like down in the comment section below. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live.